Greetings and salutations. Welcome back to the Everything Astronomy podcast. Today, Tom and I are joined by University of Michigan professor Patrick Seitzer. Uh, professor Seitzer obtained his bachelor's degree in physics from Georgetown and went to UVA to pursue his PhD in astronomy, which he got in 1983. He is now an astronomy professor at Michigan, and he conducts research in the field of space debris. So today, we'll talk a little bit about Professor Seitzer's background, how he got interested in space debris research, and how this research affects current plans to launch commercial satellite constellations. If you also find yourself interested in, today, in any of today's topics, we have linked some of Professor Seitzer's publications below. Professor Seitzer, thank you for joining us today. We're very excited to be able to talk to you. How are you doing? I'm doing great. And a pleasure to talk to you and to, to all the folks on that will listen to your podcast. So this is a real exciting area these days and uh, look forward to sharing this information with folks. So as you said, I got my bachelor's degree from Georgetown. I went to Georgetown and when I arrived at Georgetown, they closed the observatory. They used to have an astronomy department that was started back in the 1840s. And as soon as I showed up, they closed the department. I don't think there was a causal correlation. <laughs> but it did leave a, t an observatory with a 12-inch telescope that uh, fellow students and I could play with and learn a lot of basic astronomy. Mm -hmm. uh, following that, I went to the University of Virginia for graduate school, and I thought I wanted to be interested in uh, uh, radio astronomy and working with radio telescopes and stuff, but I soon discovered that my true love was sitting on top of a mountain looking at the stars with an optical telescope. So I switched to optical astronomy after a master's degree in uh, radio astronomy on dwarf galaxies. And my travels for optical astronomy took me to Australia for a couple of years where I gathered uh, data for my thesis at the Mount Stromolo Observatory outside of Canberra and uh, back to UVA to uh, finish my degree and then on to Cerro Tololo in Chile, which is the U.S. National Observatory in uh, just east of La Serena. It's at about 7,000 feet altitude and uh, it has telescopes uh, which are open to the entire U.S. national community. So if you're a grad student or a researcher in astronomy, you can go use those telescopes. And uh, I had a great time there. I was there for two years. From there, I went to Kitt Peak National Observatory outside of Tucson and then to Space Telescope. And after Space Telescope, uh, Michigan made me an offer I couldn't refuse. So I've been here for nearly 30 years, came in 1991. I'm currently a research professor emeritus, still work with students, still go observing and having a great time. I think uh, once, once looking at the stars gets in your blood, uh, it, uh, it, it never goes away. It just never gets old, uh, sitting on top of a mountaintop or out in a dark sky condition looking at the stars. So, mm -hmm. um, so my original interest, what I did my thesis on was star clusters and uh, particularly globular star clusters, which are the oldest objects in our galaxy and how the stars move within those clusters. But after I moved to Michigan, I had access to a Michigan telescope in Chile, which has a wide field of view. And we'll take some pictures of that, show some pictures right. of that later. And uh, I discovered that more and more of my images were uh, always had these trails across them, which were satellites. And uh, a friend of mine uh, at the Naval Observatory said, one person's noise is another person's signal. So I decided to make signal out of noise. Uh, went down with a couple of people to the space debris office, the orbital debris office in Houston at the Johnson Space Center, which is the lead NASA office on orbital debris, and uh, pitched to them using the Schmidt and other Michigan telescopes to investigate um, faint, optically faint uh, orbital debris. Um, so it's been a great, uh, great career. That started in 2000. The NASA funding uh, lasted for 16 years, which is a long time for a project. And right. I'll show you some of the, the results and things that we got from that uh, shortly. And when you started in the field of uh, space debris, was that, a, was that a new field or was that something that research was already happening in that you then just happened to get interested in? Uh, it was not a new field. It had been optical observations uh, had been done by many years. In fact, one of the pioneers in this field was a gentleman by the name of Carl Hennies, who got his PhD uh, from the University of Michigan back in the 1950s. He became an astronaut, uh, waited uh, 18 years for his only flight on the space shuttle. And uh, when I was coming to Michigan, he was climbing Mount Everest and had a heart incident and passed away on Mount Everest. So he lived quite an exciting life. 
Uh, when I went to Houston in 2000, they had access to a small telescope and, and facilities and they were looking to expand and do new things because the Europeans were really uh, uh, coming up fast on optical observations of uh, orbital or space debris. So uh, that's how I got into it. And we're going to be mentioning space debris a lot. So would you, would you care to kind of explain exactly what space debris is for some of the users that might not know? Okay, so first of all, let me, uh, let me explain that I will use two terms interchangeably. I'll use the term orbital debris, and I'll use the term space debris. It's the same thing. Mm. Orbital debris is the term that's used in the United States. It's the legal term in the United States. Thus, the, it's the NASA Orbital Debris Program Office. Uh, the FCC, the Federal Communications um, Commission, uh, it has to deal with orbital debris mitigation, that is keeping uh, orbital debris small. The U.S. government has orbital debris mitigation guidelines. But if you go internationally, the term used is space debris. Uh, it's the same thing, but space right. debris is the international term. For example, it's the European Space Agency Space Debris Office. Um, and so one way to think of it is that orbital debris is the imperial units, inches. <laughs> space debris is uh, measured in uh, metric units or uh, centimeters and meters and, and things. So, so what is orbital or, or space debris? Well, it's anything that's not active on uh, in orbit it's anything that's not an active satellite in orbit uh, so when a satellite um, uh, so when you launch a satellite you have a rocket booster in the final stage of the rocket booster if it stays in orbit then you try then that becomes orbital or space debris if we could look at slide two uh, on the sure. uh, uh, thing here um, then we can uh, let me get my mouse over there um, so this is a plot that shows you what is in Earth orbit today, uh, and this is from the NASA Orbital Debris Program Office. And if you look, you'll see the top curve is everything that's in orbit that the U.S. Air Force maintains a catalog of. Right. And right now, this is a, about 20,000 objects um, that are available. Uh, and then there's various categories here. So the top thing is everything. The next curve down is, uh, which is marked re-entry, is fragmentation debris. This is stuff that when, a space, when two spacecraft collide and they break up, you get all sorts of fragmentation debris. Mm -hmm. if, it's, um, if you have a spacecraft that explodes, like a rocket body, which has had two fuel right. in it for decades, and then 40 years later it explodes, um, that's fragmentation debris as well. Um, and so you can see on this plot that start, there's this gradual um, increase in objects until you get to about 2007, and then there's this total sudden jump right. in everything, and that's from an anti-satellite test, a deliberate anti-satellite test, uh, the Feng Young 1C anti-satellite test. And then a couple of years later, there was the Iridium Cosmos collision, mm -hmm. which was an active Iridium satellite communication satellite colliding with a dead Russian uh, satellite and creating another huge chunk of debris. And over 30% of the objects currently tracked on orbit are from those two events. Okay. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. most of the objects in orbit today are orbital or space debris. Right. And so with all this debris, um, obviously there's going to be lots of collisions. Is it, is, can the debris cause problems with current launches? Is, is it going to be an exponential growth? The more debris, the more impacts well, that are going to happen? Or Well, you raise some very good questions, which are at the heart of modern orbital debris research. Let me start. If you look at the left-hand side of this plot, you'll see back in 1957, there were uh, two objects. When Sputnik 1 was launched, there was the Sputnik 1 satellite, mm -hmm. and then there was the rocket booster. And the rocket booster was what most people saw because it was bigger and brighter than the satellite. So the initial catalog of objects in orbit had two objects, the satellite right. and the rocket booster. 50% of the objects at the start were debris. Right. right? And, the, and the catalog ratio has gotten better or worse depending on your point of view as you go on. So now over 90% of the objects are space debris. Uh, let, me just close, let, let me just close one thing on this plot if you look at the far right of the plot, this is, takes you to the end of uh, 2018, 
you'll notice that the curve is growing up, is going upwards. But that's not due to debris. That's due to new launches. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so people are now launching 50, 100 satellites at once on a single rocket booster. And so the curve that's going up, you'll notice how the top curve uh, corresponds very well to the increase in the satellite curve, which is the blue line near the bottom. Right. So most of the increase today, knock on wood, is due to the launch of new satellites. Now, as we're speaking, there could be a collision or a fragmentation or an explosion on orbit, and then the, the, the debris curve goes up. But for the moment, most of the increase is due to new launches uh, of objects on orbit. And what we'll see in a bit is that people are proposing to launch 100,000 new satellites over the next 10 years. Right. And, uh, so that, that curve, those two curves are going to take off exponentially. There, there is an effect known in the space debris field as the Kessler syndrome, which is when you get so much stuff on orbit that you can't, that, that you become runaway collisions. Okay. Right. That, um, and the effect is largely generated by when you have large objects colliding with other large objects, uh, creating all sorts of small debris. Mm -hmm. So, um, and oh, anyway, I'll you for your question. Yeah. We, uh, we read, when we were preparing for this, we read a study from the European Space Agency that said that there's 34,000 pieces of, uh, there's 34,000 things in orbit that are bigger than 10 centimeters and 900,000 objects that are between one and 10 centimeters. And so I think okay. that kind of... So, um... So the bottom line on, on the sketch, on the plot here, it says the catalog is incomplete. Yeah, it's probably incomplete by a factor of two. So the 35,000 objects that the European Space Agency is talking about is an estimate uh, because we know the yeah. catalog is, is incomplete. Um, and um, so that, uh, that explains that. Now, these are objects larger than 10 centimeters that you can track with radars or optically. Mm -hmm. um, between one and 10 centimeters, you can track, some of that stuff you can track with radars, and particularly with the new radars. Most of it comes from surfaces, spacecraft that have been bra brought back to Earth, and they count the little craters on them that have been caused by either meteors or, uh, or space debris. Um, so that's where those estimates come from. So one of the things that I think uh, was interesting is that there's, there must be a certain number of natural kind of meteoroids that are in orbit around our planet. Has, what, what is kind of the ratio between the number of man-made satellites and the number of just natural, occur, the just natural stuff around us? Sure, very good question. So the answer is the meteors are not in orbit around the Earth. They, they come in, they're in orbit around the sun uh, they may be the remnants of uh, comets. For example, you had the Perseid meteor shower uh, in the last couple of nights, and if it had been clear in Michigan, which of course it never is, uh, <laughs> which is why these, I'll show you in a bit, why these telescopes move to better, um, better areas. Um, but in fact, it, it's, it, it, the estimates are uncertain, but it's probably on the order of 50%. That, uh, uh, but the meteors are coming in the debris is in orbit around the Earth. The meteors are in orbit around the sun. And so they come in at a much higher velocity. So, And so I think an, an obvious and interesting thing is how do you track or count debris? Because it's really, really small. Some, I mean, you know, you said that we track over 20,000 objects that are bigger than 10 centimeters, but that's still not very big and it's still very far away. So how do you track what's up there? Or how'd okay, you find well, it? For the stuff that's in low Earth orbit, that is, it's below 2,000 kilometers in altitude above the Earth, it's best to track them in radars. Um, because you only see these things with a telescope uh, if they're in sunlight and the telescope is in darkness. So for the objects like the International Space Station and things, you'll see them at uh, just after sunset and just before sunrise. Um, because the Earth's shadow is a cone, okay, and it gets narrower and narrower the further away you go. Um, so for International Space Station, for most of the year, you'll just see it 
uh, in twilight at the start of the night and in twilight at the end of the night. The rest of the time, uh, it's in Earth's shadow. Um, so, um, so, but my expertise is dealing with orbital debris at geosynchronous orbit, which is 35,000 kilometer altitude. Um, and there, the shadow cone of the Earth is only about uh, one hour in time, 15 degrees wide. So there we can track optically all night long. So um, did I answer your question on that? Yeah, and um, so how did you, have you been doing a lot of the uh, obvious, sorry, let me rephrase that. Probably um, when you were studying globular clusters and things like that, you were likely using telescopes and using all of these astronomical techniques that have been developed for studying the cosmos and, and deep space. But then when, when you transition to um, observing sort of space debris and things closer to Earth, did you find that it was mostly the same kind of processes that were coming up again, or did you have to develop a whole new set of equipment and methods to, to deal and look at these objects? Well, no, most of the techniques were exactly the same. The one technique that's different is that when you're tracking stars, all right, the telescope tracks the star and at 15 arc seconds per second, when you're tracking, and, and you can have a constant rate all night long as you track the star as it rises in the east and sets in the west. When you're tracking satellites, uh, which is what you want to do, you're moving much faster. The rate can change uh, during the, as the object goes around the Earth. So sometimes it'll be going faster, sometimes it'll be going slower. And your exposure times tend to be much shorter because as you'll see shortly, the stars will be these huge streaks that uh, go through on these images if you're tracking the object. So um, yeah, so we used, Many of the same techniques, we use many of the same instruments. We'll show you pictures of telescopes that Michigan has access to, that um, we are just using them. We had to mod make some modifications to the software to drive them, but uh, otherwise we're good. Let me get a thing of water here. And so I guess uh, an interesting question is then, how do these large satellite streaks affect the astronomy that we want to observe for objects that are far and we have these massive streaks that go through our images? How, how, how would these affect um, what we're trying to okay. observe? Well, let's, uh, let's back up a little bit and let's go to slide three. And on slides three and four, I'll show you some Michigan telescopes uh, in Chile. Uh, the first one shows the Curtis Schmidt telescope, which is a 0.6 meter or 24 inch telescope. Mm -hmm. It's located at Cerro Tololo Inter-American Observatory in Chile. It's about 500 kilometers north of Santiago at the southern edge of the Atacama Desert. And this telescope used to be in Michigan. It was installed in Michigan about 1950. And uh, after 16 years, and I would say three clear nights, uh, that's a slight exaggeration, but not much. It was decided that it was, uh, you know, it, it had to go to a better location. Saratololo was first getting started then. And so it was moved to Saratololo in Chile under an arrangement where Michigan got one third of the time on the telescope. The national U.S. national community got two thirds of the time and the U.S. the observatory in Chile paid for all the expenses and things. So that was a win-win deal until about 2000 when the, uh, powers that be decided that uh, the observatory in Chile should concentrate on large telescopes, not on small ones. And mm -hmm. so the telescope reverted back to Michigan. <coughs> and so the choice was to leave the telescope in Chile or bring it back to a uh, uh, decaying tree covered dome in Michigan <laughs> out near Dexter. And that mm -hmm. was an easy choice to, to make. Right. And so it's staying in Chile. Uh, it will, but now Michigan has to pay for all the expenses. And um, I was told at the time you could do anything you want with that telescope as long as it didn't cost Michigan any money. And so we went out without external funding. And that's how the, the program that's called MODEST, the Michigan Orbital Debris Survey Telescope, uh, was started using this telescope because it could be devoted 100% to the orbital debris program. It was on a great site. And right. so that was very attractive to NASA. Uh, for this. So that's how that program, how the program got started back in 2000. If we go to the next slide, which is slide four, 
Michigan also has access to a, another teles pair of telescopes in Chile, and that is the six and a half meter Magellan telescopes, which were commissioned, first one was commissioned in 2000. Here we own 10% of the project. So we only get 10% of the time on these two six and a half meter telescopes. Um, and we use one for imaging and spectroscopy and the other one for uh, spectroscopy. But it's a collaboration of various institutions in the United States. Um, Carnegie, which is the lead institution, University of Arizona, Harvard, University of Michigan, and the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. And so we don't get hundreds of nights on these, particularly not for space debris, but we do get a few nights per year to look for uh, space debris and do studies there. And as far as I know, this is the largest telescope that's ever been used for studying space debris. Um, I'll just give you an example of what this looks like uh, in the next slide, which is slide five. These are postage stamps, and this just shows you objects. In this case, we turn the drive off. So we're looking for objects at geosynchronous orbit where the um, uh, object, the time for the object to go around the Earth is the same as the time as the Earth rotates on its axis. So something will appear to remain almost stationless, stationary in the night sky or in the sky. And so when you look at people that have these small dish antennas, those dish antennas don't track, okay? Right. They're pointing at, at the same point in the, in the sky. Mm -hmm. And so these are objects, these objects that were detected with the six and a half meter, they are basically the size of an iPhone, okay, that's tumbling in orbit. And you're seeing it at 40,000 kilometers away. So mm -hmm. um, they're and pretty faint. And you can see, I don't know if you can switch to mine, on one point, you'll see the black side, okay, or the thin side, okay. Right. And then the other side, you see the highly reflective side. So you'll see this, this bright object. And so... Um, you'll see this thing as it tumbles, you'll see the, how the, it flashes in brightness. And that's what you see here. These are five second exposures. The long trails that you see are stars. So if we did really long exposures, which is what astronomers love to do, the star streaks would completely cover the field. Right. Uh, and this, this would not be good, so. And so are there methods that you can use on the, on, not in, on the space side, but on your own telescope or, you know, when you're processing the images to get rid of some of this noise, or is that just a problem that cannot be solved? Well, I'll show you uh, what happens when you have uh, start, when you have satellites streaking across the, uh, the uh, field. Um, in fact, why don't we go to um, the next slide, which is slide six. Uh, and this just shows you, uh, this was taken from my driveway. It's an all sky camera. Okay, and you can see two streaks, one at the top and one down at the lower right. The one at the top is the International Space Station, and um, the one at the lower right is, the, um, is a tumbling rocket body. So if you have that screen fully blown up, you can see uh, that it's flashing uh, like we saw on the previous screen of the iPhone. Right. But this one was tracking the stars, and the satellites are just streaks. Right. This is a very wide field of view, about 170 degrees. And there, these cameras are built so you can watch for clouds and things in the, in the night sky, but they're also great for picking up bright satellites. Um, if we go to the next slide, which is slide seven. Now, this was taken with the four meter telescope in Chile, which is on the same mountaintop as um, the, um, as the Curtis Schmidt is located. Um, this was just taken uh, about a week after uh, one of the launches of the Starlinks, and they weren't trying to avoid the Starlinks or look for them. All of a sudden, they did a five-minute exposure, and they got 19 Starlink trails going across it. So this is what you see uh, if you have satellite trails crossing an image. Um, and these things were pretty bright, but they didn't saturate the detectors. So, um, but they start to take more, they take, the block, you can sort of think of looking right. at through a picket fence or through a, a Venetian blind uh, that you're looking at the star fields. And so if you were trying to study an object that happened to fall behind, behind one of these trails, you'd be in trouble. You'd have to do another exposure. Mm -hmm. But one of the things that modern astronomy is really interested in is what's called transients. And transients where you see an object flare briefly and then it fades away. 
And so if people are chasing gravitational wave sources, they're chasing exploding stars. And so uh, they're chasing actually uh, killer asteroids, okay, which are the asteroids that are in orbit around the sun, but they're close to the earth. And they could come in and hit the earth and wipe out the dinosaurs. Well, they did wipe out the dinosaurs, and let's hope they don't come and wipe us out. Right. Um, but, you know, they, that's what you're, you're looking for, and those are the sorts of observations that get interfered with uh, by these satellite trails. So, um, yeah. So let me show you one more slide. Let's go to slide eight, which shows a, um, this again is a tracking field. This was taken with Magellan, and it just shows a tumbling rocket body going across the field of view. And if you thought, if you ran this through your automated object finding system and didn't look at this image vis visibly, you know, with your eyes, right. you would think you'd have a chain of galaxies because each one of these little glints as the object tumbles, right, is, is shaped like a galaxy. And so if you mm -hmm. ran this through a galaxy finding thing, you'd find a <laughs> linear cluster of galaxies moving across the sky. And, right. and that should alert you that maybe you're not seeing galaxies, but you're seeing actually a satellite that happens to be tumbling. Right. So um, that's what the that's what the the issues are, and that's why it it affects um, uh, astronomy. And right. so. And you had previously mentioned that by and with, I believe you said within the next ten years that another hundred thousand satellites are going up, and you mentioned. Um, Starlink, would you care to explain kind of what these satellite constellations are and what kind of their, their main purpose are for? Okay, so let's go to, let, just before we get started, let's go to slide nine, which is a slide that, that you've seen before, um, which is the just the, you know, right now, the estimate is the Air Force probably tracks between 20 and 25,000. They don't tell us everything that they track um, right. for obvious reasons. Um, <laughs> But uh, the ESA Space Debris Office says, based on the models that we've done, there's probably 35,000. So we'll just say 35,000 objects larger than 10 centimeters. But um, there are now plans to launch 100,000 new satellites over the next 10 years, all into low Earth orbit. And most of these are going to be communication satellites for internet, for high-speed internet. Right. And you know, you shake your head and you say, why? Why are you going to orbit? Why don't you just lay fiber or something? Mm -hmm. and to, you know, well, the reason you go to orbit is that it's quicker to transmit the signal to orbit from one satellite to another satellite and then back to the ground than it is to go through a long uh, distance fiber. And the reason is, for the physicists among you, is that how fast light gets transmitted in a medium depends on the index of refraction. Right. And the index of refraction is 40% different for fiber, for glass fiber, mm -hmm. than it is in, in air or a vacuum. And so the transmission speed is 40% slower in fiber right. than it is if you go to low Earth orbit. Okay? And so you can transmit very long distances by going to space, whoop, satellite to satellite, and back down, and it would be quicker than if you laid fiber. Now, the fiber is always going to be quicker for the last mile um, you know, from the ground station to, to your right. house. But that's the real reason they're transmitting. Now, why do they need so many satellites? Well, the, if you were transmitting that signal to geo, it's about a quarter of a second delay for a signal to go out to geosynchronous orbit and then come back down. Right. Okay? That's too slow. You want to do- Right, that's pretty bad. You, you want to do a high-speed financial transactions. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that's too slow. So you have to keep the satellites really close to the Earth um, to where you have, you know, maximum delay times of well under a tenth of a second. Right. Ah, but the problem is that the satellites are moving so fast that you only, you have to have thousands of satellites just to have a couple of them above you at any one time that right. you can transmit to and, and get a signal. So that's why some of these constellations are extremely large. Um, they're interested in worldwide uh, communication and they're interested in really sh what, what's called latency, low latency right. time, short time delay. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the next slide shows you what some of these constellations are. That's right. So if we go to slide 10, 
This just shows you three of the largest constellations that are being planned. One is Amazon Kuiper, and they're planning at 3,200 satellites. Uh, you have OneWeb, which declared bankruptcy, um, and they're re revisiting their business plan, but they decided even while they were in bankruptcy, let's add another 45,000 <laughs> satellites that we'd like to launch until they right. file with that. Uh, and then SpaceX, which has launched now well over 500 satellites toward an initial constellation of 1,500. Mm -hmm. um, so I just want you to note two things. Notice the difference in the altitudes of these various constellations. Amazon and SpaceX are both fairly low, under 630 kilometers, mm -hmm. but OneWeb is at 1,200 kilometers. Um, and OneWeb is a very dangerous constellation for astronomy. Even though the satellites are fainter, they're visible longer into darkness than the low altitude ones because right. their shadow is a cone. And the OneWeb constellation during the summer, either in Chile or in North America, Mm -hmm. Those satellites will be visible all night long, okay? Right. So you will not be, there are images like of the Large Magellanic Cloud in the south that every single frame you take will have at least one satellite trail in it um, because of where it is in the sky and the fact that you're looking at these constellations which are in higher Earth orbit. So, um, so, so I suppose there's kind of, t sorry. Um, I suppose there's kind of two big questions that having more satellite raises because, I mean, satellite constellations are not a new concept entirely. Uh, I mean, we've had GPS, we've had Iridium, we've had, we've had other satellites uh, and constellations up there. But I suppose as with everything, once we start scaling up, we really have to start worrying about the long-term effects and things like that. So I think that it kind of, there's two interesting questions that come out of having more satellites. I think question one is how do we reduce the the star trail problem on the satellites that we're sending up? And then B, what are we going to do with these satellites when they're dead? Because from what I've read, a Starlink satellite is only designed to last for five, five years. And so then what happens? Because if we're launching thousands of satellites every year and we don't know what to do with them, that's going to be a serious problem for astronomy and for uh, commercial space launches. Oh, you think so? You really think so? Well, um, yeah. So suppose you were to launch 100,000 satellites, okay? And each satellite has a lifetime of 10 years. Mm -hmm. What this means is that in any given year, you have to replace 10% of the population. So right. you're, launching, you're going to be launching 10,000 new satellites every year, okay? Um, and but wait, what about the 10,000 satellites that are dying? Well, the guideline is that you have to replace them. You have to do something with them within 25 years of end of mission. Okay, that's what the current guideline is because the guidelines were done with uh, before these large constellations got started. You know, you're absolutely right, but that there were previous constellations launched. I mean, Planet Lab is launching constellation, but there are 100 or 200 satellites, less than 500. Right. Um, the um, you know, Iridium was 66 satellites, which was the, the initial one. Um, so th there are much smaller constellations. Uh, SpaceX now has over 500 Starlinks in orbit. They are now the largest constellation ever built and launched, okay? Mm -hmm. And they're headed for an initial constellation size of 1,500 satellites. What got astronomers so upset was how bright the Starlinks were. We knew they were being launched, okay? We knew these constellations were coming, but what we weren't expecting was just how bright these satellites were gonna be, that you could see them with the unaided eye from mm. downtown Ann Arbor or downtown Chicago. Right. That was the really frightening thing. There are hundreds of CubeSats being launched every year, which are these small 10 centimeter by 10 centimeter by 10 centimeter satellites. Mm -hmm. You never, you know, it's tough to find them. Right. But these satellites are larger and they're highly reflective in ways that we did not anticipate. And so they are now a serious challenge to, a, to mm -hmm. astronomy. And so um, what are some ways to counteract that reflectivity? Okay, well, let, let me go back up to one more thing. So uh, we were talking about what you do with a spacecraft at the end of mission. 
at geosynchronous orbit, you can boost it to a higher orbit, okay? That gets it out of the geosynchronous or the geostationary orbit regime. At low Earth orbit, you really have to cause it to re-enter in the atmosphere and make sure that it all burns up in the atmosphere be before it comes down. Uh, so that, you know, nothing, nothing hits the ground and injures you or right. the world. So, um, so what you can think of is that in the best case, people would cause their satellites to re-enter as soon as uh, they were got to the end of mission. So let's take a look at our 100,000 satellites. We got 10,000 going up every year. We got another 10,000 coming down. So right. all of a sudden we got 20,000 satellites moving up and down on their way to their final operational orbit. Um, for SpaceX and in their initial constellation of 1500, their lifetime was going to be five years. So there you're talking about 300 satellites going up every year and 300 coming back down or right. 600 satellites in motion. Um, so you really have to do something with the satellites at the end of mission. You just can't leave them uh, drifting around in orbit where they could collide with something else. Um, mm. So, and now I've lost track. So I'll let you ask the next question or ask the previous question. Oh yeah, it was um how do, how do you counteract the the reflectivity of all these uh, satellites then? How do you counteract the reflectivity? Ah, good question. Well, the first naive thought would be to paint them black. But turns out that doesn't work. That that has some side effects which aren't too cool right. for the spacecraft like, operations thing mm -hmm. because then they absorb more sunlight and they right. and the electronics yeah. get get fried. So mm -hmm. this isn't this isn't good. You you don't want to deliberately launch dark space debris. Right. Um, the, so the next thing is to try to minimize the surfaces that are pointed towards your telescope and where they see sun. And so what SpaceX is doing now for their Starlinks is they fitted sun visors on their satellites to try to block sunlight from getting to the highly reflective antenna surfaces and things, uh, and see where, how that uh, makes them. There's one all of them now, all of the new ones being launched have visors. There's one that was launched back in June and it's not quite yet at the final operational orbit, but our astro astronomers are waiting eagerly to uh, take, the, uh, take measurements of it and see how faint it will be. And hopefully it will not be able to be seen with the unaided eye mm -hmm. uh, from a really dark site. Uh, if you're a young person with great vision, and you're sitting on top of a mountaintop at 10,000 feet, right. uh, far away from the city lights, there's no moon. You want to be fainter than seventh magnitude um, right. in order not to see it. Mm -hmm. uh, and it, some of you may have really good vision and be able to see to eighth magnitude. Um, the, the issue is even, even if you got them to 12th magnitude, even if you got them to um, say eighth or ninth magnitude, so where you couldn't see them with the unaided eye, they will still leave streaks in astronomical images that are, that are easily seen. And there's just no way around that. You can't make totally stealth spacecraft um, that, that are virtually invisible. And I, I suspect there are people working on the other side that, uh, you know, in the Defense Department that have tried very hard to do that. Right. And, uh, when, I, when we give public talks, they're probably all just laughing at us. Um, <laughs> but, um, anyway, so, there's a limit. You, you can't paint them black. Mm. If you look at pictures of spacecraft and things, you'll see they're covered in this gold foil, which is multi-layer insulation blankets to keep right. them from overheating. In fact, I think if we go to slide 11 on the um, thing here, you'll see two different uh, spacecraft. Uh, one is the Starlink spacecraft, which has this huge solar panel, mm. and then the antennas and stuff are down at the lower left. Interestingly enough, when they're launched, the Starlink spacecraft change shape. That mm -hmm. is, they're, at their final configuration, they're oriented like an L, but when right. they're first launched, it's like an open book configuration, okay? Mm -hmm. And so mm -hmm. they can put that edge on to you, and it's, it'll be very, very faint. Right. When they get to operational orbit, they swing out to form an L-shaped configuration. It's a very clever design, and, um, and so then, this part here is pointing towards the earth and this point part points towards the sun. Right. What you see brightness is not the solar panel, uh, which is actually pretty dark. Mm -hmm. uh, you know from basic physics that 
the right. optimum color for a solar panel is black. Right. right? If you don't want to reflect, if you see reflection off a solar panel, it's not 100% efficient mm -hmm. uh, at converting uh, photons to electrons. Um, and so you may be seeing the back side of the solar panel, which is a, a white color, mm -hmm. or you're probably seeing the surface underneath there where the antennas are uh, pointing downward. Right. So, um, and then if you look at the OneWeb satellites, the OneWeb satellites, which are on the right side, are a fairly classical conventional design that's called box wing, where you have a central box of, uh, um, of the spacecraft, which is where your antennas and things are. You cover that in multi-layer insulation blanket, which is this highly reflective gold stuff. And then you have the solar panels, the wings out on the side. So this is a fairly conventional uh, spacecraft design even if they're turning them out very, very quickly. Starlink is now turning out 120 Starlinks a month. Uh, they're building four satellites a day, which is Jeez. an of great. So, right. And how are astronomers dealing with this, um, with the in in industry and trying to make industry make less reflective satellites? Because I think kind of have conflicting interests. Industry wants to send more satellites up that are doing more stuff and astronomers want to see less satellites that are smaller. And so how have astronomers been kind of trying to advocate for their own cause and how has industry responded to this? Well, okay. So actually the only company that's responded to date has been um, SpaceX, uh, the people that launched Starlinks, Elon Musk company. And they have respond. You could not ask for a better response. Um, I think they were frightened or scared by in May of 2019 when the first Starlinks went up and how bright they were and all the negative press that they got. And Elon Musk is heavily committed, highly committed, dedicated to uh, space travel and making um, the human race a multi-planetary race going to Mars, the moon. Um, and he quickly made it a top-down decision that they would solve the problem, that they would make these satellites as uh, faint as possible. So their first one was a satellite called DarkSat, where they painted some of the surfaces. That made it about a factor of two to three times fainter. And now they're experimenting with visor sats. They have put a tremendous amount of engineering time and money into solving this problem. Now they can't make them absolutely invisible, but they are doing their best to make them as faint as possible. So. Yeah. In, in terms of the response of SpaceX, uh, you could not ask for a better response. Well, you could ask that they stop launching, but that's clearly not in the cards. Um, and uh, very early on last year, uh, they reached out to the American Astronomical Society, which is the leading society of professional astronomers in the United States. And we now, I'm on the committee that talks to them. And we have telecoms about once a month uh, dealing with uh, these issues and which discuss what our concerns are from the astronomy community and what um, their concerns are from their end and, and what they're doing. So in terms of, you know, their response to this problem, it, it's been excellent. They have put a lot of time and money into trying to make their, their satellites as faint as possible. Um, we had one conversation with OneWeb, that is the American Astronomical Society, had one conversation with OneWeb back in February before they uh, declared bankruptcy and are now reorganizing. And uh, we're waiting to hear uh, from them uh, in the future, hopefully. Their satellites are fainter um, for two reasons. First of all, they're a different design, but second of all, they're in a higher Earth orbit. Right. But because they're in that higher Earth orbit, they can be visible for part of the year all night long. Mm -hmm. And so now, you know, if you're observing Starlinks, uh, you won't see them at midnight. So you won't see Starlinks at most observatories at midnight, mm -hmm. um, no matter what time of year it is. There'll be, you know, three or four hours, even in summertime, where you won't see a single Starlink. You won't have a problem with a single Starlink trail going across just because they're very close to the earth. They're below 600 kilometers and below. At right. 1200 kilometers though, for a, a month or six weeks uh, during the summer, those satellites of OneWebs will be visible all night long. And that's, that's, that's a real concern for us. 
Right. Uh, so, um, so anyway, um, yeah, that, that's where we are on that. So we're very happy with SpaceX. We hope that all other companies uh, have the same uh, attitude for trying to solve the problem and uh, as SpaceX has. And I mean, ground-based observation has always been hindered by the atmosphere because the atmosphere creates distortion in images and all sorts of problems. And a solution that's been adopted in the past, which worked very well with, for example, Hubble, was to send our telescopes to space. Is that something that will become far more common given that these satellites are going to go up and that this is probably just the march of progress and that nothing is going to stop it. So will astronomy have to resort to sending telescopes in space? Or do you think this is a completely solvable problem and that there still is a bright future for ground-based astronomy? Um, I think there's a bright future. Well, let's not use the term bright uh, in terms of <laughs> ground-based astronomy. But no, I think there's a fabulous future for ground-based astronomy because launching stuff to space is so expensive. Right. Um, then that it's um, it's it's really quite uh, so you know uh, even a small space mission will cost tens of millions of dollars and you can build a small telescope for you know under a million so you know it's a, easily a ten to a hundred times more expensive to go to space and if anything goes wrong you you know you most spacecraft are not designed to be replaced or repaired on orbit so you have to launch right. Orbit. Um, Hubble, we were very lucky that Hubble, when it had its initial problems, which were due to the optics, um, that you could uh, work, that, that you could send astronauts up and work on it. And they've gone there every few years. Um, so, yeah, there, there's, there, are thumb, there are major advantages to going to space. You don't have the atmosphere. But in our current technology, it's easier to build much, huge telescopes on Earth where it's just too expensive and too difficult at the present time to take them to space. So, and, and there are telescopes that have a wide field of view, like the WISE spacecraft, uh, which is in low Earth orbit. And it will see, it sees Starlinks uh, going across its field of view. So, you know, you really do have to get them out beyond where the bulk of the population is, which is usually beyond 2,000 kilometers. So. Right. And so I've also and heard, given, oh, I've also heard some interesting ideas that um, companies would want to do advertising in orbit and purposely send up satellites that are visible constantly. Is that something that the the public outreach and social tug of war would have to solve, or is is that something that would instantly get shut down? You know, the problem is there's no guidelines or regulations or laws controlling all this stuff. So there are occasional um, projects that come up. There's a Japanese project to launch artificial meteors over the Tokyo Olympics. Um, and there are other projects that, that you would consider as art projects. Uh, the Nevada Art Museum launched one that was gonna have this giant balloon that would inflate and you'd be able to be very bright. And you'd be able to see it going across the sky. And the idea was, well, this is a reflection of, uh, you'll see a reflection of us in this balloon. Well, some several things went wrong with that project. It did get launched, but nobody thought, I think when they did this, or there, for whatever reason, the International Space Station is already up there. It was gonna right. be much brighter than this art project was gonna be. It was a crewed mission. You could have six or eight people on board. Um, and so that's a reflection of humanity in in the heavens already and it has a scientific mission so why are we launching all these uh, these other satellites which have no scientific mission and are just there for art or advertising and things and so when these missions now get proposed th there's very strong pushback from the astronomical community and not just the astronomical community there's pushback now from uh, not just from the professional astronomical community, also from the amateur community, mm -hmm. uh, from the people that are trying to preserve dark skies for both, uh, you know, birds use the stars to navigate. There's pushback on that. Um, and just for cultural reasons, that you don't want thousands of satellites uh, going through your, as you go out and try to enjoy the night sky. Um, so 
Uh, yeah, there's, there's strong pushback. Every time we learn about one of these things, we try to respond in very forcefully and mm -hmm. politely um, and uh, as, as quickly as possible. So, but there's, there's no regulations are bright on uh, brightness of satellites. Um, and so right now it's just a matter of, um, you know, working with companies in a collaborative manner um, right. to try to convince them that it's in their best interest to do this. And fortunately for us, the, you know, the lead off, the lead off batter in the constellation industry was SpaceX and they have been incredibly responsive and mm -hmm. put a tremendous amount of money and effort into it to try to make their satellites as faint as possible. And is there a push by either NASA or the American Astronomical Society or other groups to try to introduce kind of regulations? Because we probably can't assume that every future satellite launch is going to be, or launcher is going to be as responsible and as forward thinking as SpaceX will, has been. So have we, are, has there already been steps taken to kind of mitigate this problem or is that still a large open question? Uh, it's an open question where it's just baby steps as to what sort of regulations and laws uh, would be needed. Note that these have to be international regulations. Mm -hmm. Everybody on the planet has to agree to them because you can have countries that decide, you know, we don't care about astronomy, but we really care about building the simplest spacecraft and we're not going to put the extra effort in there to make them as faint as possible. We're going to launch 10 or 20,000 of them for our uh, country. Uh, and, uh, you know, well, too bad for the astronomers. Um, so, you know, it really has to be an international effort. Our hope is that by working collaboratively with companies and by astronomers in every country raising the issue with their companies and their governments, uh, that a solution can be found, that it doesn't spiral out of control. And so where do you see kind of the, the future of research in space debris? and uh, the public outreach, where, where do you kind of see, what's the optimal solution that uh, most people have in mind? Ah, boy, that's a good question. I, the, the future of research in space debris is uh, set by bigger and better instruments to catalog it. Um, the Air Force has just commissioned um, the uh, space fence, which is out in the Pacific, and it will track objects. Right now, the radars can track objects down to 10 centimeters in size. And this can probably track objects down to one centimeter in size in low earth orbit. And so the catalog will just expand exponentially, not because they're new objects, it's just because you have better tracking facilities. I think there's a lot to be said for additional modeling of uh, how the debris interacts with objects. There's a lot of research going on in active debris removal where you mm -hmm. send a spacecraft up to grab a big piece of debris and cause it to re-enter the Earth's atmosphere. And, burn right. up. and there the emphasis is on large objects like rocket bodies, because you want to get them out of the way before they collide with another rocket body and you create tens of thousands of, of particles whizzing through space mm -hmm. or, or before they break up uh, due to a right. battery explosion or fuel or whatever. So, and finally, I think the thing on outreach is, first of all, planetarium shows, uh, which can demonstrate to people that, wow, if this stuff really goes, this is a problem. And mm -hmm. what I recommend to all my, every time I give a talk is for people to get away from a city and go to a dark sky site. The International Dark Sky Association has a list of sites. There's several in Michigan that aren't too far from Ann Arbor that are quite dark. Um, and just go to a dark sky site when the moon is down and just look at the stars. Just look at the stars and experience the same joy I've had since I was seven years old. And uh, it just right. never gets old. And, and then you will see satellites. You will see a few, um, particularly in twilight in the evening and twilight in the morning. The International Space Station will be big and bright. It'll be the brightest object other than Venus in the night sky. Um, but you'll see a lot of fainter satellites as well. And just imagine what that would be like if instead of having several hundred satellites that you could see with the eye, you had a hundred thousand. Um, right. Then, then it really does change the appearance of the night sky. And you sent us a really good animation showing kind of what the earth will look like if all of these launches do go as planned. So we'll put that 
we'll, we'll also link that. But I think one last question. Many people would probably be wondering, what does the day-to-day -day life of a space or of a space debris scientist look like? Because <laughs> as you mentioned, access to telescopes is limited and you don't spend all of your time just looking through a telescope. So what, what does a, a space debris scientist do on a day-to-day day -day basis? So what does a space debris scientist do on a day-to-day -day basis? Good question. Most of the time I'm staring at a computer writing software or an, to analyze data or analyzing the data itself. Uh, I'll be working with students on particular projects. I'll be sitting on any number of Zoom calls uh, with other groups trying to decide, like on the bright satellite stuff, we, we have two or three Zoom calls a week on this. Mm -hmm. um, and um, also reviewing papers of other people that have written papers on space debris, writing my own papers and reviewing papers that other people have done. And then just trying to stay on top of what everybody's planning to launch. So every day I look at the Federal Communications Commission website to see what people are proposing to put into orbit because the FCC uh, does the frequency licensing. If, if you want to transmit from a satellite down to a ground station in the United States, those radio waves need to get approved by the FCC. Those frequencies and the orbits need to get approved by the FCC. The radio waves need a visa. I mean, that's a simple way of right. landing rights is what it's, what it's mm -hmm. called. Um, and so, you know, just try to figure out what's coming, what companies are building, and uh, how bright are they likely to be. So it's a full-time job. Great. Thank you so much for talking to us. We are All right. It, it's a great field, and, and I, would, I would strongly encourage, if you go to the um, International Dark Sky Association website, they will have the places in Michigan that are dark sky sites mm -hmm. that are protected from light pollution. And I strongly encourage people to go out there, maybe with a pair of binoculars, but certainly just with your eyes, uh, when the moon is down and just see what a really beautiful night sky looks like that, that you can't see from Ann Arbor or, uh, or City. And the planetarium shows are great, but the real thing is, is unbelievable. So right. and you want to give your eyes about 20 to 30 minutes to get fully dark adapted. Um, and then you'll be able to see as faint as possible. So put your phone away, put the flashlights away and mm -hmm. just let your eyes get fully dark adapted. So you see the faintest things possible. Awesome. Well, yeah, we'll certainly put those links down below so anyone watching can check it out. Um, but we greatly appreciate you talking with us today. Um, it's been amazing to hear about um, what you do and what the, the current field of space debris research is. I'm currently active on. Okay. Glad to help. Thank you. Awesome. Thank well, you. Thank you for being with us. That was hey, everyone. Thank you for listening to this podcast episode. This is Michael. This is Sam. This is Tommy. And this is Joe. If you're listening to this on YouTube, make sure to like, subscribe, and share with your friends. And if you're listening on Apple Podcasts or Spotify, make sure to leave a review. All of the show notes can be found either in the description below or on our website. Thank you again for listening, and we'll see you next week with more Everything Astronomy.